It's good to see everybody tonight. Welcome to our visitors. It's good to have you with us, and we're certainly pleased to have you join us tonight. Go through some more announcements uh, before we get into our worship service. Scripture reading tonight is from the book of Jonah, one of the minor, minor prophets, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, if you want to uh, turn to the Bible and uh, get prepared to follow along on that. On our prayer list, we're certainly thinking of, of little Elizabeth, 10-year-old daughter of, of Joy Subin, she was nephew, and uh, she's in Children's Hospital with uh, two collapsed lungs. Let's keep her in our prayers. Ruby Brad, a uh, little three-year-old with cancer, uh, heartache, uh, but we hope things are getting better there and the doctors are finding some way to, to help her. Uh, Cindy Derryberry, always, we're, we're thinking of her and hope that the doctors have something coming up in the near future to, uh, to again address her, her difficulty. Um, Melanie French, uh, finishing up her radiation treatments for cancer. Uh, of course, Randy Smith, we're glad to hear that he's doing, doing well and his foot is healing, so that's good news. Um, Larry Wyatt's going to have uh, open heart surgery in Nashville, Tennessee, so let's uh, keep him in our prayers. And certainly we want to remember uh, Michelle White, her uh, sister-in-law Bonnie, uh, all their families as they uh, uh, mourn the loss of Mike uh, today and tomorrow with the funeral and, and visitation. Uh, Airwise singing uh, November the 15th, 7, uh, 7 p.m. If I count right, that's this coming Friday, isn't it? Boy, time is just flying. And of course, uh, that means a week from this Saturday is Brandon and Tori's wedding. That really is getting close. That's, uh, that's super neat. Um, I, I take it that Norma is holding up okay. Um, we're collecting money for our college students. Uh, we want to send them uh, some gift cards be, as they go into their finals for this semester. So if you'd like to contribute, uh, see please Krista and uh, she'll get the money together. When Michelle gets back, they'll get cards off to the uh, young people uh, the first week in December. Um, see, teachers for next quarter, the Bible class materials for the next quarter are in the, the supply room. And uh, so grab, the books are there, the things you need. Uh, go ahead and grab that, start getting prepared. It'll be looking at book by book, the New Testament. So uh, be sure to do that. And then next, uh, next Sunday is a elders and deacons meeting at um, 4 p.m. And I think that's it. We're gonna get started with our scripture reading. Boom, 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 boom. You got it? Okay. You want to do it or you want me to do it? Okay. Either one. No big words. It's okay. It's the same one I read in class this morning. <laughs> oh, is it? Well, then it you're is. Practiced. It is. Jonah, chapter 1, first three verses. Now the word of Jehovah came unto Jonah, the son of Tar uh, Amittai. And I practiced that before. Amittai, saying... Rise up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of Jehovah, and he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down unto it to go, to, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of Jehovah. This time we'll start a worship and song. First selection, I know that my Redeemer lives. It's all sing. I know that my Redeemer lives and never prayed for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free.
Next selection, 542, Pure in Heart, O God. So I'll say it. Pure Let's pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and thy holy name. Father, we are so thankful for this time that thou hast given us to come together to study thy word. We are so thankful, Father, for thy written word. We're thankful, Father, for uh, the strength and the comfort that we find in thy word. Father, we are so <coughs> thankful for this opportunity to come together with people of the same like-mindedness to study thy word and to learn more about thee. We pray, Father, that as we study thy word that our faith will increase and our willingness to obey and to trust thee will also increase. Father, we are so <coughs> thankful for thy son Jesus. We are thankful, Father, for the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. We're thankful for his willingness to leave the comforts of heaven and to come down and to dwell among men and to give his life for all. <clears throat> Father, we are so thankful for the hope that Christ gives us of eternal life. Father, we are so thankful that our Redeemer lives. And Father, we know that if we follow the, uh, the path that he has left for us and the example that he left for us, that we will one day be with thee in heaven. And Father, as we reflect upon the suffering of Christ, we hope and we trust that we'll never forget the cost of our salvation. Father, we are so thankful for this congregation that assembles here. We're thankful for each and every member that's represented here. We're also thankful, Father, for this congregation and its willingness to work and to be a light in this community. We pray, Father, that we will continue to spread thy words and we hope and we trust if it's thy will that much good will be done, and we pray, Father, that the gospel will always have free course. Father, we pray for Brother Jerry as he prepares to stand before us. We hope and we trust that uh, the things that he studied, that he will be able to bring those things to remembrance, and he will proclaim them in a way that we as the hearers, we will be able to understand those things. 
And Father, we pray that as we hear them and as we understand it, we'll be able to make the application. And Father, we pray that uh, the things that we studied tonight would bring us closer to Thee. Father, we also pray for those who were mentioned in the bulletin. We pray, Father, that Thy will strengthen and comfort them as only You can. And Father, we also pray for Michelle White and, and uh, her family. We pray, Father, that Thy will uh, bless and comfort them. And Father, we hope and we trust that they will be able to find comfort in thy word as they mourn the loss of a loved one. Father, we are so thankful for Brother Fred. We're thankful for the selections of songs that he's selected so far. We pray that we will reflect upon the words that we are singing, and we pray, Father, that we will teach and admonish one another through these hymns. And fathers, we prepare to move farther into thy service. We hope and we trust that all that we say and all that we do will always be in accordance with thy will and thy way. We ask thee forgive us when we confess and repent of our sins and turn away from them. These are all blessings we ask in our son, Jesus' his name. Amen. Thank you, J.C. <coughs> the uh, song for invitation after Jerry's lesson will be 762. Before his lesson, 315. I'll live in glory. So I'll say I'd like to stay here longer and dance a lot of days and watch the fleeting changes of the awesome of even ways. For if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high, I'll live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory here by and by. I'll dance to the story of the day. If you will, turn to Jonah chapter 1. And I want to clear up some things that Joe talked about this morning. Not really. <laughs> of all the books of the Minor Prophets, This one is probably the one that most people are familiar with. If you were to list the 12 books of the Minor Prophets, 
and uh, ask people, what do you know about each one of those minor prophets? I'm sure that if they know anything about the minor prophets, they will know about Jonah and the whale or the great fish. They know that. And when you read through these four chapters in this book, we ought to come to see that it's more than a fish story. There are many practical lessons that can be learned from this book. And we want to look at a few of those this evening. I want to be looking at, uh, we talk about purpose, we talk about plan, we talk about preaching, and we talk about pain. As we look through this book, we're going to look at the purpose that the Lord had for Jonah. And even though the Lord had a purpose for Jonah, we see that Jonah had his own plan as you begin to read there in chapter 1. So we talk about the purpose the Lord had and then the plan that Jonah had for his life. And then we talk about preaching. That is the preaching of Jonah. And some significant things need to note about that. And then in chapter 4, of course, in the book of Jonah, we're going to read about the pain of Jonah. Jonah was disturbed. He was disappointed. He was perplexed about and as you know about why God would even think about showing love toward these people of Nineveh. Jonah had a lot of problems. Of course, we all got problems. Jonah had a self problem. Jonah had a seeing problem, S-E-E-I-N-G. And Jonah had a sin problem, as we will note. A prophet of God, called by God to do something that would be hopefully helpful to the people of Nineveh. As you read through these four chapters, you will see that the focus is more so upon the man, the man, Jonah, than even his message that he was to proclaim. In chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, God points out the message that Jonah was to proclaim. In chapter 3, verse 1 through 3, again, the emphasis upon the message that Jonah was to proclaim. But as you read through this book, this is emphasizing the man, Jonah. And some decisions that he made, some choices that he made, and how that he had to come to realize that God really does care and God is really concerned about all people. So let's look at these four things. 
When you open up the book of Jonah in chapter 1, when we talk about the purpose that the Lord had for Jonah, it is very clearly stated, very concise. Notice in chapter 1 and verse 2. Now we know the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. We know that, verse 1. But notice in verse 2. You have read this. I'm just reminding you of this. The purpose the Lord had for Jonah involved a command. And that command was to Jonah... To arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. That is to cry out against it. For the wickedness, her wickedness, their wickedness has come up before me. Now notice... Here is a command, and this is the purpose that God has for Jonah. Arise, go to Nineveh, cry out. That is to speak against the wickedness that is in that city. The wickedness that is there will prosper. It will continue. It will grow. Unless it is somehow stopped. God is not so concerned about the person or the persons that are committing wickedness or evil. And God is not more concerned about certain people or certain groups of people that are committing wickedness because God is concerned about every individual, no matter who they are. Okay, here are people over here who have rejected God, they rebelled God, they rebelled against God, they have, they, they won't even think about God. And so they are filled with wickedness and they're practicing it. And it seems all the time. Is God concerned? Yes. But here are people over here that say we believe God. That say we love God. That say the Bible is something very precious to me. And I'm so thankful what God has done in the sending of His Son for me. Yet, they commit wickedness also. Now, which is God more concerned with? Listen, it doesn't make any difference. It can be the very enemies of God, certainly who are committing wickedness, and it can be those who claim to be friends with God. If they are committing wickedness, God is concerned. God is concerned. And so God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh. That great city and cry (coughs) against it. Now notice when you look at this command, and this is true Of any command that God has given. I want to look at this a little deeper this evening. And I want you to think about this. When God commands. Or whenever God commands. There has to be communication. God does not command 
something, a people, and then does not communicate to them what that command is. God doesn't say, okay, I got in my mind, I'm thinking about this right now, I, you know, I, I, want, I, I want people to do this, but I'm not going to tell them what it is. Really? Is that how God deals with man? Whenever you see a command of God, whenever God commands, that means there has been some communication from God to people. Now it says here in verse 1 that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. Now God has communicated, God has communicated His will to man in times past in various ways. Matt mentioned this morning about Moses and the burning bush. That's one way that God did so. God also communicated His will to man through visions and through dreams and so forth. Sometimes God spoke directly to individuals. In Hebrews chapter 1, the Hebrew writer says in verse 1, God who at diverse manners and so forth and sundry times has spoken to the fathers by the prophets. This is what he's done before. But he, in these last days has spoken to us by his son. For us to have a command from God, that has to be communicated to us. God does not do that through visions, through dreams, through nudges. But God does that, of course, through His Word. Without communication from God, there cannot be commands. And so today, when we think about any command that God has given, understand please, that's what God has communicated to man through His revealed Word. We know what God's will is for our life. How do we know that? Because God has communicated that through the Holy Spirit, through these inspired writers. We have it in written form. That's what Scripture is. That which has been penned by inspiration. 2 Timothy 3, verse 15 through 17. And so when you think about a command of God, that means there has been communication. When you look at this command in verse 2, notice God has communicated to Jonah where he needs to go. Where he must go. God has communicated to Jonah what he must do when he goes to the place that he's told him to go. And in this command, God has communicated to him why God wants him to go to the place and to do what he's demanding him to do. So now we have God commands. And whenever God commands, that means there has been communication. Now, did Jonah understand what God has communicated to him in this command? Yes. As I stated earlier, it was communicated to Jonah in a very concise manner, in a very, it's very clearly stated. There'd be no way that Jonah could have misunderstood what God is telling him to do. 
That's why God deals with us today. As you read in His Word and what His will is for us, it is clear, it is concisely stated. We can understand what God's will is And so God has communicated that to us through His Word. Now notice, when God commands, that means there has been communication. Today, we know it's only through His written Word. When we think about that communication... Through his written word. That means that a choice has to be made in connection with the communication that God has given in his word today. God does not give us commands. Just to be giving us commands. Whatever we understand and see that God has communicated to us in His written word, here's a command. Here are commands that must be obeyed. That means then that we have a choice. Just as Jonah. When God said to Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, and cry against it. Jonah had a choice. When we read in the New Testament commands that are for us today, we understand that it's from God. That's the source of it. But that means that we have a choice. Have a choice. Just as Jonah did. Now, notice. When Jonah understood this, about what God is communicating to him, he had a choice. That choice was to either carry it out or to cast it aside. What other choice is it? That's it. That's the only two choices Jonah had. Do it or don't do it. That's only two choices. And so the purpose of the Lord for Jonah was, and we see the command because it was communicated to Jonah. He had a choice. Every time you read of a command in the New Testament for us today, that means we have a choice. Now, that can be phrased in a lot of different ways. We can reject it, or we can receive it. We can fill our hearts, our minds, our lives with it to the extent that we're going to live it out in our life. Or we can say, Forget it. There's no other choice. <coughs> and so when this was communicated to Jonah, that was a choice. Now, when you think about any command of God, 
God has communicated it to us. We have a choice. Now, what is it that's going to compel us to make the right choice? Without exception, the right choice is always to carry out what God has said. To do what the Lord has commanded. You can't go wrong in doing that. It may not be easy. It, it, it may not be pleasant. But it's never wrong to do right. Now, what is it that should compel us to want to carry out what God has said? Think about the fact, number one, that it is a C-O-M-M-A-N-D from God. Look at the source of it. It's not from man. Or any group of men. It is a command. From God. But secondly understand. That the reason why we are compelled. To carry out God's command. Is for our own soul's sake. Oh yes, there's a source of it, which is, which is certainly, if there's no other reason, that's good enough. The source of it comes from God. And whatever God commands us to do, it's always for our good. We may not see it right now, but it's for our good. But also, number two, for our soul's sake. Whatever God commands us to do, it doesn't matter what it is. There is connection of connection. And think about that command with our soul. Every time. I don't care what the command is. There's connection with our soul. And we know how important that is, for what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What will a man give in exchange? For his soul. And so we're compelled to carry out the commands of God because of its source and because of our soul's sake. But also we're compelled to carry out his command for the sake of others. For the sake of others. The very reason, and this is really the emphasis here in this, and talk about what God is commanding Jonah to do. Go to Nineveh, cry out against it. That is the wickedness that's there. Why? It's because for their good you need to take that message to them. The wickedness, and as he talks about later on in the book, the violence that they do with their hands, that's not going to get better. It's not just one day just, everybody just stops. There has to be something that's going to compel them to cease what they are doing and to change. And that's why God was saying to Jonah, you go to Nineveh and you cry out against their wickedness. Because I care for them. Now, it may not make sense. Look at all the bad things they've done to the people of God. 
God says, I care for them. So when we look at what compels us, well, the source of any command for our soul's sake and for the sake of others. How others can be benefited. So here's the purpose of God. The purpose that God had in mind for Jonah. But secondly, and quickly, look at the plan that Jonah had. God says, go to Nineveh. Notice that God did not say to Jonah, no Nineveh. That's not what he said. He said, go. He didn't say, no Nineveh. He said, you go to Nineveh. That means he needs to be heading eastward. But Jonah had other plans because of some of his problems. He really didn't properly understand nor see the very nature of God as he should have. Nor did he properly see how God viewed mankind. So Jonah said, here's my plan. I'm heading in the opposite direction. Question, what is Jonah doing? Is he carrying out the command? That was given. No. He's casting it aside. He had his own plan. I want to, you know, he's going to change locations. He's going to change his circumstances. Perhaps his reasoning, if I do that, then that's going to make that command no longer binding. For me. Here's what we need to realize. When we do not carry out the commands of God, whatever they may be, that does not mean that they cease to be a command. We can change our environment. We can change our circumstances. We can change our location. But whatever God has commanded us to do, it doesn't make a difference. What the environment is, what the background, what the circumstance, whatever the location, it doesn't make any difference. It's still a command. It doesn't cease being a command when we do not carry it out. It's still a command. And of course, as you know, Jonah is thinking, well, I'm going to get away from all this. I'm going to get away from the presence of the Lord. Of course, we know that's not going to happen. So we see what he does. He hops on a ship. Wasn't that very convenient that this ship that he found available that he could get on is going in the very opposite direction where he should be going?
And he hops on that ship. He feels so good about this. He can sleep. He's not staying awake. He's not thinking, oh, I wonder what God's going to do to me. I know I'm not doing what God wants me to do. He is going to sleep on that ship. And you read about what God decides to do. God's going to wake him up through certain means. In fact, when you read through the book of Jonah, you see certain things, in fact, four or five things that the Bible says that God prepared. God prepared. God brought about this great wind. God prepared a fish. And in chapter 4, you see some other things God prepared. We see God's hand in this. See, we need to understand, when we reject God, when we rebel against God, there are consequences. Now, we can cast off the command, whatever it may be. But the consequence is going to be there. Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sins will find you out. Paul reminds us concerning what we sow, that's what we're going to reap. So, John, if you think everything's going to be hunky dory now, okay, we'll, we'll see. And you know what happened? I mean, those sailors on that ship, man, they, they're trying to. What's happening? They woke him up because they had a bunch of questions to ask him, one question right after another. As you read about here in chapter 1. And one of the questions they asked Jonah was, What is thine occupation? How's Jonah going to answer that? How could Jonah say, I am a prophet of God? Notice the statement made in verse 9. I am in Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. I'm a prophet of God. I fear God. I have reverence and respect for God. And I know he's the God, the Lord of all. Jonah, if you really believed that, what are you doing on this ship going in the opposite direction God had told you? You see, his practice does not coincide with his profession, what he professed. How can you fear God and then you're doing the very thing you're not doing, the very thing that God has told you to do? No something else here. Sometimes you hear people say, well, you know, okay, I mess up, I sin. And it's really nobody's business what I do because whatever I do is not going to affect anybody else. Once you ask these, if you're able to ask these, which you're not, but if you were able to ask these sailors, okay, Jonah, I, is Jonah having, having any effect upon what's happening to you now? Jonah, can you do wrong and it not affect those around you? I mean, there's so many examples in the Old Testament, especially of this, that when you do wrong, not only are you going to hurt yourself, you hurt those around you. You remember Achan, what he did. 
when he took those things out of the city of Jericho. It wasn't just Achan that suffered. As a result of that, everything he had was burned, even his family. So don't tell me, well, you know, it, it's not going to affect anybody else. These satyrs come to understand that the reason why they're having the problem they're having on the sea was because of Jonah. And Jonah even pleaded with them, throw him in, throw me in. Because Jonah, now, he understands what's happening on this ship. It's because of me. And of course, it's amazing when you read this, how the sailors were really showing great concern for Jonah because they're, they're trying to get to the shore, you know, so they won't have to throw Jonah on, overboard. And so they're trying to do this. But it finally came to the point where they understood. This guy's got to go. And they threw him overboard. And the storm stopped. The wind stopped. Listen, what we do affects those around us. We can never get away from exerting an influence upon others. Can't do it. So don't even try. And God prepared this great fish for Jonah. It wasn't just, I'm going to prepare a great fish. You know, I, I like to create things, so I think I just prepare a great fish. But it's for Jonah's benefit. To test him and to transport him. And you read in chapter 2 how Jonah was while in that great fish, how he came to his senses at the point of death. And he cried out to the Lord. And this great fish vomited him out on dry land. We're going to see a changed man for a while. And that's in chapter 3. The purpose of the Lord had for Jonah is stated very clearly, concisely. But the plan that Jonah had was in opposition to that. And so a price had to be paid. And Jonah had to go through some things to bring about his change in his life. Fred is about to lead us in this song. A song of encouragement, understanding that whatever God has commanded us to do, it must be carried out. God commands us to certainly to hear his word and, and to believe and to develop faith. <coughs> To repent of our sins, confess Christ, and to be baptized. We have a choice. We can carry that out. Or we can cast it off. If we cast it off or cast it aside, that means consequences. 
and we're not going to like that. God is going to give Jonah a second chance in chapter 3. For the word of the Lord came into Jonah a second time. This evening, you have the opportunity. If you haven't yet obeyed the gospel to render obedience, as a child of God who has sinned, you have the opportunity to do something about it this evening. If you need to respond, we're not come as together we stand and as we sing. The table has been left prepared for anyone that needs to partake of the Lord's Supper this evening. At the singing of this song, we ask that you come to one of the front two pews and you will be served the Lord's Supper. On a hill far away.
So remember our midweek Bible study, uh, Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, those that are mentioned in our bulletin that's on our sick list, uh, those that have lost loved ones, pray for them at this time, and those that are fighting for our country. If you would stand for the closing song, remain standing for the closing prayer. Beyond this land of party, losing or leaving, far beyond the lost earth, far killing this, and far beyond the taking, and the bereaving, by the summer land of bliss, land beyond so fair and bright, land beyond. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for another opportunity for us to come and to worship. Father, we're thankful for the message that we heard tonight. Help us to remember the importance of listening to the commands which you have given us in the Bible. Help us, Father, to uh, not carry out our own plan, uh, but to bend to your will, to make sure our life is in accordance with what we find in the scripture. We're so thankful for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf, that while we deserved the punishment and the death that our sins um, required, that that sacrifice was, paid, uh, was made on our behalf and that ransom was paid for us. Father, we're so thankful for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray.